So next, I will go to um, who we are. Reaper Action leads bold action to increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. We bring a left flank analysis to that work and a willingness to hold folks on all sides accountable, whether they are allies or opposition, and a commitment to nonviolent direct action is what leads us. And now I'll kick it over to Jasmine to uh, go over what's what with this developing uh, policy topic. Hi, Shireen. Um, so we wanted to start setting the scene um, in February 2024 when the Alabama Supreme Court um, essentially ruled in a case that um, extrauterine embryos created during the IVF process are akin to children and are covered by the state's 1872 Wrongful Death of a Minor Act. Um, so this case came about when embryos were accidentally um, destroyed at a clinic um, leading um, parents of that embryo to sue the clinic. Um, and then essentially during um, the hubbub caused by the Alabama case, um, it essentially created a lot of confusion for clinics about whether they were allowed to continue to offer IVF treatments. Um, and the ruling also states that um, the wrongful death of a minor law applies to all children, all children born and unborn without limitation. Um, and that's a quote from the majority opinion. Um, in March of that year, uh, Governor Kay Ivey of Alabama signed protections um, into law regarding IVF, which essentially allowed clinics to resume patient care, um, but it did not impact um, the state's Supreme Court decision that an embryo is equivalent to a child. Um, if you want to continue, Shereen. Great. Um, yeah, so anti-abortion um, groups were pretty ecstatic about the Alabama Supreme Court case, um, especially because it helps them push their idea of fetal personhood, which is the idea that um, all or the idea that fetal or legal rights are conferred to embryos upon conception. Um, so uh, yes, I mean, it would mean unborn children have legal rights. Um, it's a mess. But basically, um, the anti-abortion groups were really upset about um, Alabama's governor signing the protections into law in March. Um, so a coalition of anti-abortion groups, including Live Action, Susan B. Anthony, Pro-Life America, Students Life for America, or Students for Life America, and Family Research Council um, all penned this open letter um, denouncing the um, protections that was, were signed into law in Alabama. Um, and then here you can see um, Live Action at the bottom, basically also saying that um, they agreed with the Supreme Court and um it and how it um pushes their idea of fetal personhood and then yes all right so um there were a number of different um legislative processes that tried to follow the um alabama news so um one example was or two examples were the House Resolutions 1043 and 1037, um, which Republicans Nancy Mace from South Carolina and Lori Chavez Jerumer um, from Oklahoma um, respectively introduced. Um, and essentially, Students for Life of America were also really upset about that. Um, and they accused both politicians of perpetuating misinformation alongside the pro-abortion left about IVF um, and threats to um, its access. Um, in, in May, Louisiana um, was going to, or I'm sorry, Louisiana had a bill um, that it was considering in its legislature that would carve out IVF protection despite the state's full abortion ban. Um, and an important piece of context here is that Louisiana, Louisiana is the only state in the US that prevents 
IVF embryos from being destroyed in its state borders. Um, however, that protection um, never coalesced um, and never um, passed through the House and is consequently not in law. <laughs> All right, um, so there have also been other federal um, recommendations and proposals about IVF. Um, so the Heritage Foundation, um, who was behind Project 2025, and then the Ethics, uh, um, Ethics and Public Policy Center, um, they are both conservative think tanks, and they um, drafted the Restore Act, um, which basically promotes the idea of restorative reproductive medicine. And while all those words sound great together, um, what they mean by that is really blurry. Um, they also refer to um, restorative reproductive medicine as integrative fertility. Um, but in pushing integrative fertility, they often a uh, fear monger about hormonal birth control, um, especially um, the claims that birth control might be linked to low success rates with IVF. Um, however, we all know the truth that contraceptives um, do not cause um, issues with fertility um, and are not just band-aids as referred to um, as, or as previously referred to. Um, yes, and then more recently, Representatives Breachin from Oklahoma and then Matthew Rosendale from Montana um, sent a letter to the CDC basically um, asking for more information from um, the IVF industry um, about its processes. Um, and um, you can see that the letter was supported by a large amount of anti-abortion groups who are also anti-IVF um, and are probably just using this letter um, to stir more controversy about IVF and um, try and expose the quote unquote big fertility industry. Um, all right, and then I think I'm kicking it back to you, Shireen. Yes, you are. Thank you so much for laying that all out for us. Now I am very excited to have the opportunity to introduce everyone to Jamie, one of our speakers today who resides in Birmingham, Alabama with her husband and son who is conceived through IVF. She works full time from home as a senior management business analyst for a leading HRM software company. Thanks to her company's expanded insurance coverage, which now includes fertility treatment, Jamie was able to pursue her dream of growing her family. However, her medical treatment was halted when the Alabama Supreme Court declared that embryos are people. Driven by a deep dedication to her family, Jamie has since become a passionate advocate for increased protection and accessibility to IVF for those facing infertility challenges. She played a crucial role in securing legislative fixes in Alabama that allowed IVF clinics to reopen. Jamie's advocacy has taken her from Alabama to Washington, D.C., where she testified before the U.S. Senate Committee on the Judiciary and to the Minnesota State Capitol, where she supported the Minnesota Building Families Act. This is really inspiring, important work, and we're so grateful to have you with us, Jamie. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Well, first, um, can I just ask uh, about your fertility journey and how the ruling by the Supreme Court this year impacted that journey just a little bit more? Yes, absolutely. So I was diagnosed with PCOS, of course, which is polycystic ovary syndrome. I have a pituitary tumor. I have only one tube. So all of those things together have been contributing to my inability to get pregnant on my own. So we did start fertility treatment um, shortly after getting married in 2017. And we successfully were able to conceive my now two-year-old son uh, via IVF back in 2022. Um, and then ultimately, we decided to continue expanding our family. We met with our doctor on Valentine's Day of this year to go ahead and plan out our second transfer, which, you know, if you're familiar with the IVF process, that typically involves a few procedures and a lot of monitoring just to make sure your body is in the best position possible 
um, to have a successful transfer. So we started that on Valentine's Day and literally a couple days later, that's when that Supreme Court ruling came down um, that classified embryos as children. And we saw through social media, we had a lot of things that were sent to us via news outlet from families and friends of ours um, where our clinic basically released a statement advising that they're going to be pausing IVF treatments due to the legal risk following that ruling. So typically, you know, although we were not yet at the transfer piece of our journey for that second transfer, things just kind of put a pause until we were able to kind of get some additional legislation passed to begin that treatment up again. That is incredibly grueling and I really appreciate you for sharing. Um, so you've done amazing work as I started to detail traveling across the country advocating for legislative protections for IVF. Um, can you give us a bit more detail about some of the legislation you've been able to uh, get introduced and pass advocating for or against uh, what we've discussed with legislators through this work? Yeah, absolutely. So now I'll start off by saying I am brand new to this advocacy journey. Um, this is not something that was in my wheelhouse, but what kicked off with the Alabama Supreme Court with um, ruling embryos as um, children that, you know, that definitely hit home for us and we knew we needed to be on the front line. And so one of the first things that I was involved in was advocating on a local basis here in Alabama and going to the state house, which I was joined with over 350 other individuals, um, just to kind of speak with legislators there so that we can get SB 159 passed, which is basically a bill that provided um, civil and criminal immunity to people who provide goods and services related to IVF along with us as patients as well. And so because of all of those individuals, we also were able to send over 33,000 emails as well to all of our local legislators to help get that passed. So we did get that passed, which is amazing. But of course, if you are familiar with it, we know that that's only a Band-Aid fix. And now we are in jeopardy of that specific bill being ruled as unconstitutional. So that's the fight that we're currently um, in right now. Um, other bills that I've kind of helped advocate for, I've been to DC, so I know that we recently saw the Rise to IVF Act, um, which that initially was introduced back in June, I believe. So we went to DC and I was able to sit in a gallery and witness that vote line and pretty much the same outcome that we had here recently, where we didn't get enough votes that we needed to get that sent over to the House, which, you know, I kind of anticipated that, um, but it was still amazing to even have that vote there on the floor, but it was definitely hard hearing and seeing all of the nays, knowing how much, you know, we need the need of protection. Um, so help advocated for that. Another bill that I've been helping to advocate for is the Minnesota Building Families Act, which is in Minnesota. So went there, met a lot of amazing people there. One of the things with Minnesota is that, you know, even though IVF is available there, it's not covered by insurance. So there are a lot of people there that need IVF, but they're unable to access it simply because they don't have the care. I remember um, meeting one individual who was diagnosed with cancer and she wanted to do fertility preservation, but of course couldn't afford the out-of-pocket. So it's those types of scenarios that are common way too often. Uh, but what the Minnesota Building Family said, it basically will provide the insurance coverage for infertility diagnosis and treatment, um, including the IVF, and then also ensuring that the definition of infertility reflects the medical definition, which includes fertility benefits for the LGBTQ and um, partner persons as well. So those are just a few of the um, bills that I've been able to advocate for. And I think right now, mostly what we're focused on now is helping to kind of get something done here in Alabama. Amazing work. Um, and I and others are incredibly appreciative of all you've put into um, making this literal affirmation of life and family values um, become a reality for a bunch of people. Um, since we do have some extra time um, in this section, if you'll permit, I do have an additional question um, that I'm just thinking of as you speak. So your storytelling is so powerful and something we've seen as really 
effective in the abortion rights advocacy space has been storytelling as a tool for political change. Um, given the the grief and sensitivity for storytellers about fertility challenges, I want to know if you have um, any recommendations or advice for other women and families to start sharing their stories for change? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think I mentioned early on that, you know, in this advocacy thing, this is brand new territory for me, something that I've never done before. But because, you know, my family and I felt personally attacked, we knew we needed to get out on the front lines. We couldn't just sit there and stand by. We needed to get out and act. And one of the toughest things to do, of course, is tell your story, especially on such a national level. Um, but what I've also found to be way more important is telling your story with just your family and friends. Um, because a lot of, you know, what I've kind of found out is that a lot of people that are not directly impacted with infertility or have a direct tie to IVF, they simply just don't know. I remember having a conversation with my mother-in-law and I invited her to Minnesota with me just to kind of be there with me and have that support. And, you know, my family was not involved in the process when we went through our first transfer. So a lot of what they are finding out is brand new to them. And I remember her, she was like, Jane, I'm just so sorry because I didn't know. And so the biggest thing that I think we can do now, no matter how tough it may be, is to find the strength and find the courage to tell your story to literally family. Think of your grandmother, your grandfather, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, people at work. Um, have that conversation um, because a lot of it is just unawareness. They simply don't know what the journey is like, what the process is like, what IVF is. I remember a guy asked me a few months ago, IVF is just a pill that you take, right? I'm like, no, it's definitely way more than a pill. Um, so a lot of it is just education. And I know that sometimes it can be tough trying to figure out how to have that conversation. And one of the things that I found that has made it easy for me to have that conversation is simply wearing something. Like if I have on my Protect IVF shirt or something that says IVF related on, that simply starts the conversation because someone will ask about it and then I'm able to lean in and tell about my experience and how I'm impacted by IVF and everything that's going on because even my neighbors across the street were unaware that IVF was even in a huge ordeal as it is now. So a lot is really just educating those around us and just finding moments, even if you're just, if you're attending a family event, a cookout, or maybe a baby shower, a wedding, just finding simple moments that you can have that conversation with and say, hey, I wanted to talk to you about something that's really important to me or wearing something again that has IVF related and that would definitely help to spark the conversation. Thank you so much for your responses, for speaking with us today. Um, and I can only upvote the power of merch to destigmatize, to start conversations. Um, that's a really good tip. And thank you for your bravery and willingness to share with us. Um, with that, I'm going to kick it over to Jasmine and Jesse. But um, before I go, just remember, if you have any questions for Jamie or any of our speakers, drop them in the Q&A box and we'll get to them at the end. All right, thank you, Shireen. Um, do you wanna hit the next slide, please? Great, um, so our next panelist is Jessie Loesch um, and her pronouns are she, her, hers. She is the government affairs manager at the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. She received her master's in public health with a concentration in maternal, child, sexual, and reproductive health and her background is in early childhood education and abortion access in Latin America. Um, Jesse, I wanted to start off asking you about the Alabama Supreme Court case, um, decision and how that ruling impacted providers of IVF in Alabama. Your your courage, um, it's really its really incredible and inspiring. Um, so as, as a lot of you already mentioned, um, this decision came down on a Friday. Um, I, <laughs> as, as many of us, I think I, I sort of reacted with a 
dual response of, of course this happened, and also how could this have happened? Um, but in the immediate aftermath of the LePage decision, um, all of the biggest clinics in and across Alabama shut down. Um, I also just want to note that this is this case that this was based on, and I'm not a lawyer, was is very specific. Even um, you know the legislation that has been introduced in the interim that we're going to talk about could not have prevented what happened. Um, so I think just just important to note as we as we start talking about it. But we um, ASRM, who which represents um, reproductive medicine providers, put out a survey similar to one we put out after the Dobbs decision, asking our providers who are uh, reproductive endocrinologists, embryologists, uh, researchers, for their feelings. You know, what what are you all feeling in the in the in the immediate aftermath of this? And to a person. Um, they noted that they, their staff, and their patients were not only more anxious, but more confused and concerned about what the legal implications of this could be. And that is across every single state. Um, and I think that very similar to the aftermath of abortion restrictions and bans, that confusion is part of the point. You know, you don't need to ban something to stop it from happening if you induce this sort of chilling effect and, and really fear. So physicians in other states, again, even, you know, I, in that weekend, um, which I'm gonna demand that we take back because that was not a weekend for any of us working in this space. <laughs> um, I heard from uh, providers working in clinics in Pennsylvania, Nevada, California, asking how they would be implicated. And some of that is just because of the technicalities of IVF. Often, um, embryos are stored in states where the procedure is not taking place. Um, now, obviously, that's because of these restrictions, but sometimes that's just because of uh, size or space or where people have moved. And so the questions in the interim were, even if I'm in a state where, or my patient is in a state where IVF is legal or protected, what if their gametes or embryos are being stored in, and this is a, this is a real question that we got, in Idaho, which had recently passed the so-called abortion trafficking ban, and if in Alabama now um, an unborn child is decided to begin at the moment of conception, am I trafficking an embryo? into or out of a state. So all of these questions were happening and it was really hard to reassure um, members in other states because the reality is without these federal protections that you all brought up, really nobody is safe. Um, I think it's, you know, Jasmine, you noted before that anti-abortion groups came out and celebrated this and that really shows the direct connection between IVF and fertility treatments and abortion and for a really long time those had been siloed you know people were working in the infertility space they were not working in the abortion space or in the contraception space and so they really had their heads down and I think it it has if I'm going to find a silver lining those silos are bringing, beginning to break down as people realize that these are interconnected issues this is a spectrum of reproductive medicine and implications on one really affects them all. Um, you know, I, I forget who and I apologize mentioned contraception, but oftentimes people going through IVF are put on a round or two of contraception. And so any legislation that affects contraception is going to affect IVF and vice versa. Um, that was a really long answer to your first question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, no apologies needed or accepted. I really appreciate your thoughtful response to that. And I really think it points out how there's no real thing as like a safe haven for reproductive health in America because everybody's rights are under threat no matter where you are. Um, again, because all of these issues are so interconnected. Um, and going off of that, Jesse, I wanted to ask how state legislatures or state legislators, sorry, um, or about how state legislators in Alabama passed um, the bill in March 2024 that would protect IVF. Can you speak more on the impact of that bill and whether it went far enough to protect IVF in Alabama? 
Yes, and I'm going to immediately say no, it didn't. Um, I think you uh, stated previously that what this bill did, it was it it re and Jamie, I believe called it a band aid. This bill reacted to the practicalities of a state essentially um, criminalizing uh, IVF, and so, but it it did it in such a way where it did not address the crux of the issue, which is personhood or the legal status of an em of an embryo, and so. This, and, and I will say, you know, I work for an organization that represents doctors and our doctors came out in, in concern, <laughs> at least, about this bill because it provided sort of blanket protections for both those um, organizations that deal with products, so, um, you know, shipping embryos, vials, things like that, um, and also doctors. What we heard was, Patients should have the ability to bring forth legitimate medical malpractice, you know, concerns against their doctors. Doctors don't want, or not all of them, want these blanket protections. And on top of that, because it didn't address the constitutional issue, in Alabama, the Constitution still states that an embryo has the legal status of a person or a minor child. And so these doctors are sort of, as we've heard from them in person, caught in this limbo between being protected, but also whenever they are, you know, fertilizing an egg or about to do a transfer, um, they are handling what the state is still calling an unborn child. Absolutely. Thank you for that answer. And I think it just shows how much pressure it puts on doctors um, in the recent years um, to have this legal liability hang, uh, hanging over their heads, um, even though doctors are not lawyers. Um, I also <laughs> wanted to ask you quickly um, if you could speak to IVF legislation from other states um, since the Alabama Supreme Court ruling. Um, and to that point, which legislation is most helpful or harmful to IVF access? Yeah, of course. I think a lot of states, um, again, after a little page decision, sort of reached out and said, wait a second, could this happen here? What can we do? And we saw this in sort of two different prongs. And Jamie spoke to us really beautifully. You know, there are two separate issues at hand here. One is protection and one is coverage. Um, and you really cannot have protect, like can't have adequate protection without addressing this personhood issue. And so we saw states um, try to ensure that within their statutes, um, there's, there's, you know, a person is defined as um, a born living person or an embryo is not defined as an unborn person. Those were both really important. Um, but as Jamie spoke to, you know, you can have protection, but without coverage, there's still so much inequity um, in terms of IVF. So we're seeing now Governor Newsom has FB 729 sitting on his desk that would provide um, coverage for most Californians for IVF. Um, Illinois did both really beautifully. They ensured that an embryo was not defined as an unborn person and expanded coverage. Um, I think what's really exciting is we're seeing attempts to cover the Medicaid population as well um, in some states, but there still exists the sort of um, real gap between states that want to, or states that are able to protect and cover, and states that are sort of leaving this personhood issue off the table. Um, and tr as in the words of a gubernatorial staff I spoke to, trying to do something without dealing with that status of an embryo, and that gets all sorts of sticky. Cassie, I really appreciate you sharing your expertise today. I would listen to you all day talk about IVF protections <laughs> and can you better safeguard them. Um, and hopefully we can hear more from you during the Q&A section. Um, but for now, I'm going to pass it back to Shereen for our last panelist. Thank you so much, both of you. I'm really thrilled to hear Jessie speak and hoping some of you have questions for her or any of our other speakers in just a minute. Um, with that, I will move on to Carla Torres, uh, who is coming to us from uh, as senior counsel um, at the Human, ah, 
that is not supposed to happen at the Human Rights Center at the Center for Reproductive Rights, where she leads U.S. work on assisted reproduction, including advocacy to promote equitable access to fertility care without discrimination, ensure the rights of all parties to a surrogacy agreement, and combat embryo personhood efforts in legislation and litigation. Additionally, Carla leads the center's human rights fact-finding work and supports efforts to integrate international human rights norms and strategies in domestic advocacy to advance the full spread spectrum of reproductive rights in the U.S. Carla joined the center in 2017 and has a JD from uh, the AU Washington College of Law here where I am in D.C. Thank you so much for joining us, Carla. Thank you for having me. So um, with you, I will open up. Just tell us about how abortion bans and personhood laws impact IVF access and care. Sure. Well, you know, it's been clear to us um, at the center and in the Reaper movement for a very long time that access to fertility care um, is part of a person's reproductive lifespan and very much intertwined with access to abortion, to dignified maternal health, contraception, comprehensive sexual health education. All of these are on a continuum and they can't really be discussed in isolation. And so not surprisingly, um, we see efforts to undermine access to abortion, contraception, uh, you know, access to sexual health education replicated in the context of access to fertility care like IVF. So total abortion bans, for example, regularly include language about personhood, either fetal or embryo personhood, which is the idea that an embryo or a fetus has similar or identical rights to people. And obviously beyond abortion, these laws have harmful implications in other reproductive health contexts, context, excuse me, including IVF access and as, as well as standard of practice. And while states definitely introduced these kinds of bills in past legislative sessions, the Dobbs decision in 2022 really emboldened legislators to more brazenly push for them since um, it came down um, in June of 2022. We saw an increase in these kinds of um, bills introduced in 2023, and that trend has remained the same in 2024. Just this year, we saw 38 personhood bills introduced or carried over from previous sessions across 21 states. Um, and that included Colorado, Indiana, and Iowa, which introduced legislation that would define a person in their criminal code to include an embryo from the moment of fertilization. And in the previous year, we've seen similar efforts in Alabama, Arkansas, Alaska, and Illinois. And here I'll note that um, thankfully none of these bills were enacted, but just to give you a sense of what we've seen since the Dobbs decision. Obviously granting embryos legal rights undermines people's reproductive freedom and autonomy. Um, it also undermines the goals and practice of IVF and ultimately the goals of hundreds of thousands of people who undergo IVF to build their families. And that in part is because to give patients the highest chance of pregnancy and live birth, IVF often involves the fertilization of more than one egg to create as many embryos as possible. And of course, not all embryos have the potential to develop into a pregnancy, and discarding unused embryos is common during IVF treatment, but patients and doctors, of course, can't do that if embryos are considered legal persons. Personhood laws would likely upend the standard of care of IVF as well. If embryos are granted legal personhood, that means that providers may be reluctant to provide IVF care out of fear of facing civil, professional, or criminal liability for any act that potentially jeopardizes the existence of embryos. For example, actions like unsuccessfully sawing a cryopreserved embryo for transfer or transferring an embryo that then doesn't implant, which is unfortunately very common in IVF care. And this is something that we're seeing uh, with abortion, abortion bans as well, right? Doctors are either leaving or strongly considering leaving states or stopping practicing in those states where abortion has been banned or severely restricted because their professions are being targeted with extreme civil, professional, and criminal penalties. Um, we also see embryo personhood efforts in litigation, and, and as many of you have talked about already, um, but most often we see these efforts in disputes between couples over ownership of embryos that they've created via IVF where one party wants to use them to try and become pregnant and the other does not. Um, and although this wasn't a fact pattern in Alabama, 
that state Supreme Court's ruling finding that embryos in the lab are the legal equivalent to people under its wrongful death of a minor act, um, which Jasmine recapped and of course had very um, severe consequences um, for, um, for many folks in the state, um, had devastating consequences and meant that clinics were fearful of continuing their practice and actually indefinitely paused their care. And since the LePage case in Alabama, we've seen multiple states introduce bills to protect people's rights to IVF, as was being discussed earlier. And we've also seen um, in Congress this same effort um, around the Right to IVF Act, which has twice been called up for a vote in the Senate and twice failed to get the necessary votes to move forward. Yes, thank you for laying all that out. Um, I really appreciate you drawing the very explicit connections between abortion access and uh, fertility assistance access. It's so clear that uh, all these facets of our reproductive lives just cannot be um, in a silo. And uh, I especially like that you mentioned that a law does not have to go into place for it to create a cooling effect on access, whether it's the um, potential patients not uh, seeing it as a reasonable means uh, of getting care anymore or on the provider side. So really thanks um, a bunch for laying that out. I'll move on to our next uh, question. So before the LePage ruling, um, there have been other barriers to uh, infertility care and disparities in access by race and income. Can you describe some of these barriers um, and how the latest attacks on IVF and other repro health care uh, just compound them? Of course, yeah. And, and just to, to put a finer point on what you said, the, the chilling effect is really a, a really harmful byproduct of even introducing these kinds of bills, just creating misinformation or disinformation, really making people feel confused and afraid um, is, is absolutely um, a part of the tactic by anti-abortion and anti-reproductive you know, freedom and autonomy advocates um, and legislators. And so I think that that bears um, repeating. But to your question about barriers and disparities in the um, access to fertility care space, um, I just want to start by sort of level setting a little bit. Um, to, to better under, understand what we're talking about, I want to share that the World Health Organization has found that one in six people worldwide are affected by infertility, which is understood by the World Health Organization, the CDC, by the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, which Jesse represents as the inability to become pregnant after 12 or more months of regular sexual, uh, sexual intercourse. Um, in the US, the CDC estimates that between 2015 and 2019, one in seven women between the ages of 15 to 49 had difficulty becoming pregnant or carrying a pregnancy to term. And while these estimates give us a better understanding of the scale of infertility incidents globally and in the US, they don't actually account for the number of people who need fertility care to build their families. And here I'll speak specifically about single individuals and same-sex couples who aren't fully considered in the research that is done by institutions like the CDC and the WHO um, that sort of presuppose um, that a person is cisgendered and heterosexual couple and or married. Um, in the US, people of color, low-income people, people with disabilities and the LGBTQ plus community access fertility care, including IVF, at disproportionately low rates. For example, black women in the US are nearly twice as likely to experience infertility than white women, and yet they are less likely than white women to receive care. We also see below average rates of fertility care use among Hispanic and American Indian Alaska Native women compared to white count, their white counterparts. And we also see that Asian Pacific Islander and Black women have reported longer periods of infertility and a longer um, uh, sort of access to fertility care at later stages compared to their white counterparts. And these disparities, mm -hmm. unfortunately, though not surprisingly, reflect those that we see in other areas of our healthcare system. And there are numerous barriers that lead to these disparities and, and many, many reasons that could take up an entire webinar and then some to discuss. And some of those include a lack of insurance, which, which you were already talking about, Jamie and, and Jesse, 
high out-of-pocket costs for folks who don't have insurance coverage, limited information about these insurance mandates or insurance coverage, discriminatory laws and policies, and of course, stigma and provider bias. Um, all of these individually, but also in aggregate, put assisted reproduction care, including in vitro fertilization, out of reach for a lot of people. And so since 2017, the center has advocated for laws and policies that ensure equitable access to fertility care without discrimination, including by tackling some of the barriers that I'll briefly discuss, and by destigmatizing fertility struggles and um, using fertility care to build your families. Because we see access to fertility care as a human rights issue that impacts people's rights to health, um, including their sexual and reproductive health, and to equality and non-discrimination. And of course, it's also an issue of reproductive justice, economic justice, racial justice, and LGBTQ plus rights. So we're working closely with partners across the movement to make sure that people are talking about this using that framework and that we can all push for equitable access to care without discrimination. So the first barrier is the out-of-pocket cost of fertility care. If you don't have insurance coverage, it can be prohibitively expensive for most people because a single cycle of IVF can often cost up to $20,000 and multiple cycles are often needed to achieve or result in a pregnancy and live birth. There's also a lack of insurance, as Jamie was talking about, in Minnesota. Um, not all states require insurance companies to provide fertility care coverage, and of those that do, not all require coverage for IVF. Um, there are 21 states in the District of Columbia that have what are known as these insurance mandates that require coverage for fertility care, but only 15 of those require coverage for IVF. And all of those, or nearly all of those, insurance coverage mandates only apply to private insurance, like the kind that you get through your employer. They don't apply to public health programs like Medicaid. And in fact, there's currently no state um, insurance mandate that requires Medicaid to cover IVF. There are two bright lines or two bright spots, I should say. New York State and the District of Columbia mandate Medicaid coverage for ovulation enhancing medications and monitoring while taking those medications. And while that isn't the full IVF cycle, it does cover the expenses for a, a piece that is quite expensive for a lot of people to be able to afford those medication, um, those ovulation enhancing medications, excuse me. We also see discriminatory laws and policies that result in either direct or indis indirect discrimination and that reinforce or perpetuate some of the disparities that I was just talking about. For example, insurance mandates are sometimes written to include eligibility requirements that can discriminate against single individuals and same-sex couples who are trying to avail themselves of that coverage by requiring them to meet the definition of infertility, which again presupposes that a person is cisgendered in a heterosexual couple and in some cases um, married. So while there may be coverage, you may have coverage, you're paying for that coverage, it's actually not inclusive of everyone who needs that access to fertility care. Um, of the 21 um, jurisdictions that I mentioned that have those insurance mandates um, that require fertility care coverage, only eight of those are LGBTQ inclusive. And notably, three of them require that the insured um, use their spouse's sperm, and that's the language used, to undergo IVF. Again, presupposing that that person is married, female cisgendered, and in a heterosexual relationship. And lastly, but really, really importantly, is stigma and provider bias. We need to remember that healthcare providers are people with, you know, I think, you know, thoughts, experiences, and sometimes harmful preconceived notions about who should be able to access fertility care to become pregnant and to parent. We have seen um, healthcare providers act as gatekeepers and discriminate against people with disabilities, for example, as well as people who have high BMI. So just to, that's a very <laughs> brief recap of the barriers that we see in some of the efforts that we've been working with partners to try and address. Um, but just to, just to underscore that each of these barriers individually can sometimes be the but for in terms of accessing the care that people need to build their families. And in aggregate, surely it means that a lot of people who need access to fertility care for many reasons, including IVF, intrauterine insemination or IUI, fertility preservation, as Jamie was talking about earlier, aren't able to access that care because 
you know, it's too expensive, they don't have insurance coverage, the, the laws and policies in place are discriminatory, or the healthcare providers they're seeking care from don't, you know, reflect them or have these harmful preconceived notions about, you know, communities who should have access to this kind of care. In addition to all of the attacks that we're seeing on abortion, on contraception, on fertility care at the state and national level. Um, I wanted to hear you all uh, speak on what we might expect to see in terms of future legal and judicial challenges to IVF. I can, I'm happy to start. This is Carla. Um, I mean, I think I mentioned that since 20, since 2022, the Dobbs decision, we've seen increased efforts to enact personhood um, legislation. I think that we will continue to see that in future legislative sessions, unfortunately. Um, I know that there have also been um, talks about, or immediately in the aftermath of the Alabama um, State Supreme Court's ruling, we saw, you know, legislators talking about so-called ethical IVF, um, which to to me at the center really reminded me um, uh, about trap laws in the abortion context, so trying to regulate um, healthcare providers and the way that they provide care. Um, and so I, I could see potentially efforts in the future to, you know, regulate the way that IVF care is provided to such an extent that it actually undermines the sort of medical standards, ethical patient-centered approach to um, IVF care, um, and, and of course leads to um, unnecessary care um, or increased costs for patients. Um, you know, so I, I could see those kinds of efforts translated into the IVF context with, you know, really harmful consequences for healthcare providers and patients as well. Thank you all for joining us and uh, please sign up for the next one. Hopefully it won't be this uh, troublesome on the tech side. Thanks again, y'all. Bye.